So I'm Neon Felicity. Um, I'm a philosopher, a utopian philosopher, um, specifically um, uh, that I try to analyze the context of uh, uh, emergent trends in evolution um, uh, and the history of the evolution of civilization in particular. Um, I've just finished this uh, trilogy of a treatise that wasn't originally going to be that long, but um, the first volume is going to be published soon. Um, uh, it's called Obsolete the Leviathan, an Evolutionary Techno-Utopian Manifesto. Um, and the first volume is titled The Peace on Drugs, Ec Ecstatic Epiphanies, Escaping Dystopia, and Abolishing the Fascist Tyranny of Prohibition. And so a lot of this is going to come from, that, from, from volume one. There will be some stuff from the other volumes, but I'll cover that in future talks. Um, so I kind of wanted to start with a poem. Um, I think I can do it from memory. Um, so, uh, sorry, should I, is this a good distance? For, is it a good, a good volume? Okay, sure. Cool. Um, there is enough for everyone, so why are some still poor? Who is it that these assemblymen are really working for? Not you. Of that you can be damn sure. The golden rule in a society of fools is that the gold owners make the rules. Is it still a nation of laws when the Congress works for crime bosses? Here's a civics lesson. A fat cat digs his grubby little paws in his deep, deep pockets, bribes a congressperson, gets his bill on the docket, and sits back and watches as the stock price skyrockets. It's that simple, really. You are nowhere in that equation. They might not actively hate you, they just don't even factor you in. The system ain't built for humanistic purposes, it's just an extraction machine. Seriously, that's really, really all it is. They can launder their blood money with PR statements and advertising, but that definitely doesn't actually make it clean. What you don't know can hurt you, but the emperor is standing nakedly, and all the kids are saying it too. When will we make a break between our glorious future and tragic past, what today is just routine? The people of tomorrow will blast as savagely and lavishly obscene. Uh, and I can't be emphatic enough that things can change dramatically. Um, and although these times are tough, we need to open our minds radically. Social evolution ain't easy, it doesn't happen automatically, but if we approach it diplomatically, openly and undogmatically, we can transcend the, these prejudiced divisions. Dogmatic hatred is an unintelligent prison. It serves only to keep us all oppressed. Are you still afraid to take the acid test? Get outside your comfort zone. Don't ignore the muffled moans of your kindred who are in distress. Be kind to strangers and the dispossessed. Poor folks deserve better than payday loans. Their pain, their pain should shake us all to our bones. They should have their grievances addressed. It's a true scandal from east to west. In every city across the country, millions are going hungry. Encampments are forming under bridges. Perhaps it wasn't their decisions. Maybe it was the vicious system that does nothing but enriches those who need it least of all. It's ugly. Some folks just have way too much money. Maybe someday we'll realize the market is not our ally, and all of this is structural. Our ills are not just cultural. We can design a better world if we wish to, and leave all of this behind. Don't be like the sheepish who let their neighbors be ghettoized. It's time to officially recognize that poverty is technically obsolete, but the commons has been privatized. Wall Street owns Main Street. Undo that damage and decommercialize the fundamental necessities of life, without which no person can survive. It's time to find, finally find out what lies beyond the horizon of imagination they wanted us to have for this nation, beyond the toxic cash fixation. We need radical excessive wealth taxation. And yes, expropriation of the resources being wasted on the, on the whims of a corporation with no incentive to heal the community's utter desolation. Poverty is inherently violent, and it's time to put an end to it. It's a daunting project, yes, I know, but that just means we must begin. The future is approaching. Comprehend it, recommend it, represent it. It's up to all of us to mend it. There is enough for everyone, so why are some still poor? Who is it that these assemblymen are really working for? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Cool. I was I wasn't sure if I was gonna be able to like, remember it. Remember it all. So I had it. Like, cool. Okay. Thank you. So, anyways. Got that part out of the way. So, I guess I wanted, after that, I wanted to start with some defining some terms because the, the concept of utopia is something that I think a lot of people uh, a lot of people define in their heads in different ways, and there's a lot of uh, mixed interpretations of it. And um, it really is a simple concept, and it just technically just means no place. So, a utopia is just a, a world that doesn't actually exist in real life. So, a lot of people put the concept of utopianism and utopia in contradistinction with realism. And so I wanted to also define realism at, um, and propose a, an, a more advanced way of thinking about reality um, that's beyond the 
what is generally called realism, which is really just a um, a uh, euphemism for pessimism in a lot of ways. The 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 deep cynicism that I'll get into the origins of cynicism in ancient, from ancient Greece in a, in a minute, but because um, I want to I, I want to recover some of the virtuous aspects of of the cynical tradition. But I think that there's a form of cynicism today that um, masquerades as realism, but is actually um, an impoverished um, interpretation of what's really going on in reality because it doesn't acknowledge the fact that reality evolves. The one true fact about the universe that it seem, that seems incontrovertible and that all the other laws of physics and everything um, um, uh, is organized around and it was like we, are, we, are, we constantly are re adjusting our uh, understandings of the way the world works but the, way, the one thing that's most important at the, and at the, at the core of uh, reality is evolution and so and it's and evolution is accelerating exponentially since the Big Bang 14 billion years ago and so we had the emergence of like from the primor primordial, prim primordial ooze like it took billions of years for our plants or for plants to evolve so it took 10, 10 billion years just to get Earth, and then it took another. Um, well, I guess, and then life did emerge relatively shortly after that. And then, but the evolution of life on Earth has also been accelerating us exponentially since the beginning. So we get we, we didn't get so for the first four billion years of life on Earth, it was ish. Uh, uh, it was mostly unicellular organisms, and we didn't get multicellular organisms like higher life forms until like 500 million years ago, like half a billion years. And then after that, it was like the, a lot of the animal phyla that evolved and that exists in the world today kind of exploded out, out, out of the Cambrian explosion. And then we didn't get like, so like, and then uh, so to zoom in, I'll, and I'll progressively in this story zoom into, so, uh, you know, a more par parochial version of right here and now. Okay. Like, to, so to then to focus on our species, we didn't leave the trees, like we were, living in trees up until 10 million years ago until um, we developed an enzyme that enabled us to break down alcohol. So we, it made us able to um, eat the rotting fruit on the forest floor. So that's part of, it opened up a whole new food source for us. So, and that, alcohol is not a psychedelic, but it, it, that is why, that, that is when human consumption of alcohol technically began, when the, this mutation of this enzyme um, emerged 10 million years ago, and that's what enabled to us to transition to terrestrial um, lifestyle, and then that is what enabled us to, you know, start walking upright, and that even didn't even ha occur up until, um, like, uh, like four million years ago. So it took five million years for us to like stand up, basically, and like start and start using our hands, and that, and that's when the first tools that we know of were used 4.4 million years ago, and then. If we don't get, um, we don't get the like, the we don't lose our fur coat, which enabled us to run because we could sweat, and so we could, ch you know, chase the animals at longer distances, and so we could, uh, un until uh, like about anatomically modern humans is like 300,000. So it's like each, you notice each one of these increments of these major evolutionary phase shifts in our existence are, 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 have been happening closer and closer together since the beginning and so we get down to language or oral language in 50,000 years ago and then we get uh, uh, like agriculture and which is the beginning of civilization like 12,000 years ago and then we get writing like 5,000 years ago and then we get so it's just like each one of these major phases like are happening closer and closer together and then so um, that, f that fact, and you know, we all can go up into the Industrial Revolution was only 200 years ago, and that you know has changed literally everything. And then we got have, we've had multiple Industrial Revolutions, like we're currently in the third or fourth, depending on who you measure it, how you measure it. Kind of the fourth is now with biotechnology and all that. Because the first Industrial Revolution was a steam engine, the second was um, electricity, and then the third was computing, and then the fourth now is um, you know AI and robotics and uh, genetic sequencing and uh, genetic engineering and things that we don't even know we're like it's it's so crude at this point that you know it's causing like apocalyptic damage because we don't know how to um, run it as a lot of these things have gone like the, the early factories when we first invented factories were absolutely atrocious and I mean most factories are still pretty atrocious because they've managed to uh, when uh, labor laws were uh, like um, agitated and instigated by communists 
then they just were like, okay, well, let's figure out a way to move this factory to somewhere else and we're going to overthrow their communist governments and p install some uh, stooges that will run factories the way they want them with child labor and no safety standards and all that. So, but as the world progresses, each country is slowly developing social movements for change around those things and reforming and that's why the, the, the factories have to keep moving around to find the cheapest labor uh, because we haven't fully automated them all yet. We're in the process of automating all, a lot of these factories and so I think that uh, I mean, I'm getting way ahead of myself because I was but anyway sorry so I'll, I'll back up before I get to that part because that's uh, that's something I do want to get to at the end. Oh I forgot to bring a clock to keep track of it so you can hold to keep track of the time. Um, but anyway, so that whole that whole story is just to illustrate the fact that reality evolves and it's and evolution is happening at faster and faster rates. Ray Kurzweil said it's an axiom that uh, the only constant is change, and he says, uh, but that's actually wrong. Uh, uh, change is not a constant; it's ex accelerating exponentially, and so we ha we can't even really understand reality without acknowledging the rate of change, which is accelerating. So that I call that meta realism. It's realism about realism. To, to, to be truly realistic about the possibilities for civilization, you have to take into account the accelerating evolution of the world, of the cosmos, as far as we can measure it. Um, so anyways, um, the next concept I wanted to, or next thing I wanted to clarify, um, is that utopianism is often used as a, um, a cudgel against, or a pejorative to dismiss, um, like, ideas about how society could be improved and how things could be better, radically better, because they say, oh, well, utopia can't exist. Um, and it's like, that's why I defined in the very beginning, yeah, by definition it can't exist. You means no and utopia means place. So it's the whole point of it is to imagine a different thing. And, uh, but in the other co popular conception of it um, is, um, you know, a, an idyllic, ideal sort of civilization. And in that sense, um, I think that I want to I, I want to set out at the beginning of this that I think that there's an important distinction between naive optimism about the future, like people who think that things are just going to improve um, without our um, effort. You know, like that's why I said social evolution doesn't happen automatically. Um, so I, I think there's a naive optimism that a lot of people have that, that, that things are just going to get better. We don't need any activism. We don't need to you know do anything, and it's just auto automatically get better because of cosmic evolution. But I think that uh, misunderstands the extent to which we, at this point, since civilization has emerged, um, and let alone civiliz the, the industrial, industrially revolutionized civilizations of the last couple hundred years, like, but really going back to 12,000 with agriculture, like, the forefront of evolution on Earth is like being uh, implemented and actualized by human beings, like the, our, the human mind has become the dominant factor, that's, that's what they call the Anthropocene. Human activity, the human thinking has been the thing that is, sh is like shaping the way that evolution unfolds and so we are, like w w Walter Benjamin said, um, it's a great quote, he said, the communist experiences himself as merely a, an instrument helping to actualize a necessary historical process. And so the, all of this evolution that we're experiencing, it's only going to happen if we are, if we act as the instruments to en enable it and, and activate, actualize it. And so all of this, you know, intentional, uh, you know, culture that we're developing here in places like this and whatever, I think that it's trying to steer the ship of evolution in a way that is beneficial to as many people as possible, you know, and ideally people including other species and and potentially the sentient um, artificial intelligences that are going to be emerging in the next uh, couple decades where you know there will be sentience and consciousness in these machines as so uh, machines as we know them I mean human beings are also machines in a different way but I feel like we're that, that's part of why we need to um, like that's why the concept of of, uh, of personhood is so important because uh, damn I'm getting way ahead of myself again him and I'm like, I'm like, okay. Damn it, that was also shit I was gonna get to at the, towards the end. So, anyways, um, I wanted to distinguish a good way to uh, see the um, the different this is the distinction between different types of um, the the bad utopianism and good utopianism is like there's these two concepts millenarianism and millennialism and so they are 
both um, millenarianism believes that there's going to be a coming like golden age um, of you know social progress and goodness or whatever uh, but that is going to involve a cataclysmic breakdown of everything that currently exists and but then there's a different strain of thought called millennialism which which believes that the new the new millennium the golden age is just going to peacefully and smoothly transition from this into that and that's the part I kind of think is naive I think that there's going to be there's like especially given the resistance to change anything in, or that has been evidenced in the past 50 years as we've like learned about climate change and, and people, scientists have been screaming like hey civilization is going to collapse if you keep doing this and they just kept doing it anyways and the more, the more the scientists screamed the more they doubled down and made it worse and deregulated the industry and, and, like, and so it's like they're accelerating us towards this collapse and so I have to believe that whatever comes after this will be better and more beautiful than what we have had so far. So every mass extinction event that has happened, that we're in the, middle, in the middle of the sixth mass extinction event, every mass extinction event has enabled, has opened up new evolutionary niches in the ecosystem for new uh, animals and new whole families of species to, uh, to emerge. And so all of the, a lot of the biodiversity, like, like the, the one where the dinosaurs died, like we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been able to emerge if as these macro fauna mammals uh, in order to develop the brains that we did in order to develop civilization if the dinosaurs hadn't been eliminated with that probably meteor 65 million years ago. And so there's some extent to which I feel like even if it is in, um, if, it, if there's, I want to get to this part at the end. Okay. So anyways, that's this defining terms part. <laughs> so then I wanted to, okay, so I think um, I, have, I had this theory a while ago that I think the way, the, I think the reason that we romanticized the 1960s so much is because in the 60s there was kind of a realization that um, the new future uh, that people were imagining after doing LSD and, and mushrooms and whatever was going to involve a cataclysmic meltdown of capitalism like and all of the dominance hierarchies racism and sexism and homophobia and um, you know orientalism because Vietnam War like the, all of this all of these uh, these things like um, people understood when they tripped that it was like this is, that civilization was so corrupt that it was going to have to fall basically like the, that there was going to have to be a um, a collapse and I feel like part of the way that they they uh, were able to shut that down it wasn't just the drug war it wasn't just literally waging a war on us <laughs> uh, to uh, any uh, the peace movement it was by criminalizing our sacraments uh, it was it was in doing a very sophisticated like um, like a keto move, you know, so that's where they, where you take the energy of your attacker and use it against them. It's like they kind of figured out how to do that against the peace movement. They figured out how to use people's desires for freedom against us and figured out how to make it turn into, okay, everybody's just on their own and turns into some Ayn Rand free market, you know, libertarianism or whatever. And so they figured out a way to make it so that, that people, um, uh, weren't able to see the problem anymore because they were they did they were fooled with a bait and switch and so that's part of how we ended up with the alignment of the fucking like the Reagan revolution like somehow starting to align values with then that was that was literally a, a fascist takeover of an all, of an already fascist uh, government <laughs> it was like and so and they managed to make the people, like a lot of psychedelic people and people who thought that they, you know, were under radically reinterpreting civilization as, you know, for the next paradigm to align with those people. And they, had, they literally spent billions of dollars on think tanks to pr produce propaganda to trick people and run this fucking scheme on us. And so that, was, that's, that explains a lot of the history of the last 50 years. But... Um, it wasn't the first time that that has happened. And so I kind of wanted to transition from that short p portion of the 60s. And so I'll come back to the 60s uh, in, a, in a bit. But I wanted to outline um, the, how the echoes of, um, of, of that part um, 
had already kind of happened um, in ancient Greece. That's kind of, it's, a, it's a big part of how ancient Greece um, succumbed to um, the the original fascist tyranny, which was state Christianity. So first, first of all, but you have to okay. So so to understand Jesus, you have to understand. And, well, sorry, and to understand Christ, say Christianity, you have to understand Jesus and the Roman Empire, and to understand that, you have to understand the Elsinian Mysteries and what the Roman Empire came in came in as like the uh, civilizational like nemesis or like an, an, anti pole to. So the Elsinian Mysteries were going on from at, the, the earliest records that we have are from 1600 BC, and so it, and it was a it was a mystery cult that. They had a transformational festival. It was a biannual thing where people would make pilgr pilgrimages from all over the Greek-speaking world, and they would drink this potion and they would watch a play in under, under in the underground part underneath the temple, and they were where they would experience the myth of Persephone and Demeter. So it was like the the so the ancient Greek religion was an experiential religion. People, the reason people were it, were so dedicated to it was because they had this. This uh, this sacred initiation rite into this psychedelic cult, this polytheistic pagan cult, and uh, so that was going, that was happening, that happened from 1600 to around 400, so 396 A.D. So it's about 2,000 years. But in the middle of that, um, sorry, yeah, right in the middle of that, there was the Peloponnesian War, which was between some of the Greek the Greek city states, primarily Athens and Sparta. And Athens was the was the cultural center of Greece, where they produced, you know, where they held the Eleusinian Mysteries. It was a few miles outside of Athens, but they, that's where Athens is where democracy and philosophy, as we know it, and theater and, and poetry and all that, like that we know of, that 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 historians call the foundation of Western civilization. That all comes from ancient Greece when they were tripping balls and inventing it. Like and uh, when you study Greek myth in detail, it's very apparent. <laughs> it really fucking is. And so during the Peloponnesian War, I was trying to figure out. I was trying to figure out like why there was a, why a Socrates didn't emerge in ancient Greece before he did. So Socrates lived. He died in 399 um, BC. So and he lived to like 60, 60 or 70 or something. So I was wondering, trying to figure out like why. Um, um, a Socrates didn't emerge before that, and I think part of it is that, um, like you know, despite the fact that they were, were tripping, and they should have been had the critical thinking that Socrates, you know, modeled and kind of uh, started a tradition of philosophy as we know it um, by talking about. It. And it was it was that I think it had something to do with the war. I think it had something to do with the Peloponnesian War in the same way that. People were tripping balls in the 1950s, but it didn't create a revolutionary movement until the 1960s, when everybody started getting drafted into the Vietnam War. So I think there was, I think there's, a, there's a, there's a, uh, there's an interesting tension there between warfare, like, which is like our primitive ape um, impulses for domination and control, versus our our uh, evolutionary like relationship with psychedelics, which. Oh, and I skipped the part earlier where in that evolutionary timeline that psychedelics created civilization through creating our minds the way that they did and creating language. Um, but I hope that you're all familiar with Terence McKenna's stoned ape hypothesis, so hopefully I don't need to explain too much of the details of that, but if you are not familiar, uh, please look into it. Uh, it's a very important uh, uh, origin story for uh, the human species, uh, and uh, but I definitely don't have time to get into it that much. But uh, look up Terence McKenna lectures on it and you'll... Uh, You'll have a lot of fun, but uh, so, anyways, so, so Greek culture, um, so the death of Socrates, in the same way that, um, in the same way that the death of Malcolm X, the assassination of Malcolm X, led to the Black Panthers, because there it was like, or when I mean, the, 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 the preaching of Malcolm X still led to the foundations of that ideolo of the ideology of revolutionary Black communism in America. But it didn't it didn't fully blossom into a whole nationwide movement until he was assassinated, and then because it was like oh shit maybe then he really was right about all the shit he was fucking talking about, and so <laughs> so I think it was similarly something similar happened with that in ancient Greece when they executed Socrates as for um, for corrupting the youth and be, for being a natural philosopher because um, he was asking difficult questions of the aristocracy in Greece and talking like basically challenging their 
supposed virtues, and they're, they, he, was, he was pointing out how what they were doing with, and, with their, and their, 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 their pantheon and their, and their, their, uh, their, their, dem their democracy wasn't as legit as they, you know, claim, as they, as they claimed that it was or that they thought it, that it was. And so one of, the, one of the schools of thought that emerged after, after the death of Socrates was cynicism. And I think that that's a, it's a really important um, historical phenomenon because it show it it um, it um, so cynicism was really big during that Athenian democracy, the period where Athens had a little bit of democracy. It was an elite democracy, so not every person could vote. Um, but it was so, so it was kind of, it was kind of I don't remember if it was exactly like the uh, land requirement, like in the beginning of America. But it was something like that, you know. Obviously, they had slaves, and, and slaves couldn't vote, and women couldn't vote, and like there were, some, there were some philosophers back then who said a woman could vote, but like they, I don't think they were able to. And there was only because I remember I do happen to know that when they voted to execute Socrates, there, there was 280 people in the in the in the deliberation hall, and so that was, obviously wasn't the whole of the society of Greece. It was just like the the people who got to vote. It wasn't a king, that's why it's technically, they could, you can technically trace the roots of democracy to it, uh, but it was an elite democracy, whatever. And so, um, the, and then cynicism kind of died down after Rome conquered Greece, because part of why Rome was able to conquer Greece because of all the infighting. That's why the movie Sparta is a uh, militainment, it's like literally Pentagon propaganda because it shows the, the, the Spartans as the heroes and the good guys in that war. They were the bad guys. They, 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 the Athenians just wanted to trip and do art and philosophy. And the Spartans kept fucking going over there and trying to conquer them, murder them. And that movie 300 shows the Spartans like they're the heroes of the story. And, and so that's why you know it was funded by the fucking Pentagon. So, anyways. So, uh, I, th I just thought it was important to make, uh, point that out. <laughs> so, anyways. Um, and then cynicism kind of died down, and it didn't get picked up again until um, after the, around after the American Revolution and the emergence of modernity. Um, cynicism became um, more popular because there, it was it was a rejection of the of the conventional values and the desires for uh, wealth and fame and power that were masquerading as virtue in ancient Greece, and, the, and um, so the cynics. Were very against property, and so they, you know, the, the ancient cynics and ancient Greeks, like they would renounce property, and they they would live, uh, you know, at, on the streets as beggars, and um, and and they would loudly criticize the the, the civilization. So it's kind of like the you know the like you know the like homeless dude on the corner in the fucking downtown with the sign that says the end is near. Yeah, you know, you're all fucked. You're, you're all your civilization is corrupt. Like in, in our current society. Like those were the cynics in ancient Greece. That's where the concept of cynicism comes from, and so it when it when it was re, when the term was reintroduced to our lexicon in the in the 1700s, they it was a, der a derogatory term because it was the only people who were reading writing at that time you know, the, uh, were kind of the elites, the, the the people who were who had achieved these you know aspirations for wealth and power and fame, and so um, anyways. Um, I believe that and have um, read convincing um, arguments for the fact that Jesus um, was um, more um, um, influenced by cynicism, by the tradition of Greek cynicism, because he spoke Greek, he existed in the Greek world, and that's, um, I mean, he was multilingual, but Greek was his main, main language. And so I think that, and that's part of why Jesus was against property as well. He said so you had to give up all your possessions to be in his cult. And I think he was also a shaman in, from the tradition of ancient Greece. Like, I think he, because you know, he traveled to Greece like, many times. And so I think he, um, and this was erased from the fucking historical record, but I would be shocked if he didn't, if he wasn't initiated into the Elsinian Mysteries. Like, the, the, but he was at least also influenced by the Hebraic tradition of monotheism. But I think, I, think that it, I think that this theory explains why Jesus' philosophy is so radically different than the, um, than the uh, theology in the Old Testament. Because I think it, it's, not just, it's not that he was God and God changed his mind or whatever. It was that, no, he just was in a different philosophical tradition. Uh, and that's why he, because that's why he went up, ran up in the fucking temples and overturned that shit because they were money changing in the temple. And he's like, hey, fuck you. This is not spirituality. And, 
and, and so, and that's why he got assassinated, just like Socrates did. <laughs> it's like, it's the same story again and again and again. And so, um, and then, but because of his, because his cult was, uh, was psychedelic and, a, a, you know, a, an experiential religion, a Gnostic cult, um, that's why they couldn't crush it, even though the Roman Empire was trying so hard to shut him down. Um, and, you know, his fo a lot of his followers also got executed too. But uh, anyways, but they, it, they couldn't crush it, and so that's why 300 years later, Emperor Constantine decided to create a state religion around it. Oh, he didn't create a state religion. He, he decided to um, convene a council, the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, to codify a specific set of gospels uh, and, and, you know, modify them to fit a, a uh, you know, to create a religion that would be suitable to run an empire with. <laughs> and so that's where, that's where Christianity, as we know it, comes from. And so and he convert, he, Constantine con converted to Christianity, but he didn't make it the state religion until, and so that was a generation later, in 380 AD. Um, the, it, was, it was called the Edict of Thessalonica, and that's where it made um, pr Orthodox Christianity the um, official state rel religion of the Roman Empire. So even Gnostic Christianity was also considered heresy, punishable by death. And so they, from from 380 on, from from 380 on, basically, literally, for about, like, until the, uh, basically, until the like, American Revolution, really, they just literally went around. Have, have, they had just they started a practice of just going around the world, murdering everyone who wasn't a Christian and would refuse and refused to convert to their form of Christianity and refused to stop doing psychedelics. And so that's what, and so. In three, in literally only took them less than a generation. In 396, they went and destroyed the temple they, this, this, of Eleusis, which was like the cultural center of Greece. That's, and so that's part of how, like Rome had already conquered Greece, but they, but they, so I don't know how they let Eleusis continue to go on because Rome conquered Greece in like 60 uh, BC. And so that's part of why, you know, the uh, governor, or Pontius Pilate, the one who ordered the execution of Jesus, was a, he was a Roman governor, he wasn't the emperor, emperor, but he was like doing the bidding of the emperor, of the Roman emperor, obviously. But even though he was like in Greece, like, it, or, and that whole, I mean, the borders were, there weren't like borders back then, so it's like, the Greek speaking world is what the phrase they always use, but. So anyways, so fast forward, okay, so they shut down Eleusis, and, and, Burned, literally burned alive every pagan they could find who <laughs> refused to stop tripping. <laughs> and then that collapsed Western civilization for a thousand years. And we called it the Dark Ages. Like, no, no, no good things were produced by Western civilization from around that time, from around 400 to, like, the Renaissance, the 1400s, the, the printing press was invented in uh, 1443. At, and so that is when people started getting out. That's when literacy spread beyond the like scribes or whatever. There was like, there used to be just a small, small cast in society of people who knew how to read and write because books were so laborious to produce that it didn't really make economic sense to have literacy for the masses. And so um, when the printing press happened, that, that's when literacy spread, you know, to more common people. And so when that happened, um, and, and a lot of it, since we were still living in um, feudal Christen, Christendom, where we weren't allowed to not be a Christian, um, a specifically Orthodox Catholic Christian, or whatever, um, whatever, because um, this was before the Reformation, people were only taught how to read so that they could read the Bible. <laughs> and um, but then it just so happens that there were other books that had survived from ancient Greece, the works of Plato and you know Hippocrates, and well, there's various poets and playwrights and stuff that. In, in ancient Greek philosophers in ancient Greece that the people during the Renaissance started getting access to. So they started being able to, since they got literacy, they started getting able to read books other than the Bible and they started getting to read the books of ancient Greek culture that were written by people who had been initiated into the Eleusinian Mysteries. So they kind of got a secondhand um, download of the psychedelic wisdom of the ancient, of ancient times. And So that's how, part of how they, had, they were able to have the Renaissance. And that, um, that combined with a few, emer like, that you know, enabled the like, emergence of some um, more 
you know, acculturation and more open-mindedness to trade and stuff through, you know, and that's how the merchant class was able to emerge and, um, and that's the primitive capitalism, like in the early stages of the Renaissance. And so then that starts to slowly emerge and we get a scientific revolution and, um, and where, you know, where, you know, Galileo figures out that the, or I mean, Copernicus, Copernicus figures out and then Galileo proves that the earth is not the center of the universe, which is like the, uh, which is like the thing that makes it, I can't even imagine what it would be like to have been a Christian in the 1600s and then have some scientists come along and be like, hey, actually the uh, church has been lying about what the center of the fucking universe was. Like, <laughs> like, pretty sure that would discredit the thing a little bit, the hardcore. Like, so it makes sense that like, they, you know, that they locked up Galileo and, um, and, uh, and so anyways, th despite all the suppression of the emergent science during the scientific revolution that was only possible because of the Renaissance and the access to ancient literature, and the printing press also made it so that science could, could come into being because you could codify who was figuring out what and where. Like when people would do science experiments in, in one town or one country, they could write it down and, uh, and then scientists elsewhere could verify it and that's what led to the... the uh, process of the scientific method where people replicate each other's studies and stuff and that's how we kind of know, that's how we know we don't know things there's no such thing as real knowledge but we can approximate or or have high high confidence in the probability of the truthfulness of any given fact um uh so and that led to um that led to the enlightenment which um so the enlightenment is like a tricky co a tricky thing because it's like um but how are we doing on time actually 20 minutes left? Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> Definitely, I'm, I'm only halfway through the first side of this. All right, I'm going right, to I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to fuck the, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try, I'll speed up. I might just skip a couple steps, but. Thank you. Cool. Um, so the reason the Enlightenment was so, um, as, was so contradictory was because they, they were able to figure out that we needed to establish things like civil rights and freedoms. Um, but we had been so, um, like, spiritually and civically um, and morally retarded by the Dark Ages and the criminalization of paganism that had happened for a thousand years. That was that's a big time to forget and have a whole, literally do slot, mass slaughters all around the world of people who understand our relationship with the earth and our relationship with each other and morality as we can access it and understand it. Um, via, via tripping like so since they didn't have that they only had a primitive secondhand version they were able to like create this the the the, the, the like the depth of hypocrisy that was written into the US Constitution while they were they literally opened the fucking thing with where everybody's created equal but we still have slaves like the, the, that level of hypocrisy is like it is only explainable by by the fact that they were able to access the writings of ancient people who had done psychedelics but they hadn't done psychedelics themselves so they hadn't actually experienced the the deep empathy with others that is necessary to fully have a moral like a legitimate moral compass and so that's why they did the genocide and the slavery and set up the civilization in the corrupt in the foundationally corrupt ways that it did and also it was the revolution of the it was just a new a new aristocracy that was no longer going to be hereditary. It was going to be going to be based on who's got the money and who can who can exploit each other the best, and, rather than just who got born into the right family and had the richest dad or whatever. And so, so to um, okay, let's skip a couple things. So then, what I wanted to point out a, a, a parallel is uh, you know how the you know Mark Twain says history doesn't repeat itself but it rhymes. It, I think that the evolution is a vortex, and so I think that we're going somewhere. I don't think we're I don't think we're running in circles with the way history repeats, seems to repeat itself and rhymes, and we seem to be going through the same patterns over and over and over again. And it you know it's, it gets frustrating when you pay a lot of attention to it because you start to think like, are we ever learning anything ever from any bad things that happen? And so, because sometimes it seems like we're not, but it, I think that we are. It's just that we're not fully learning the lesson because, but we're uh, but I think we're we're going around in a in a we are you know, ascending evolutionarily as we keep repeating and keep, you know, re having to relearn things. But it's in an accelerated fashion. Like I said in the beginning, evolution is accelerating exponentially as it, as it goes. And so the, 
the process of um, early Gnostic Christianity ossifying over the course of a few hundred years um, into an authoritarian you know, nightmare in, in state Christianity that turned into this um, genocidal fucking uh, imperial machine that just like went around the earth <laughs> like uh, with death and destruction. I think that the same thing is happening now with capitalism. Capitalism was revolutionary when it first began because it was it, it was overturning feudalism, which was even more um, uh, unjust and corrupt. But and that's why it, it was celebrated as this new freedom, uh, you know, 400 years ago. Even though they were still doing genocide and slavery, it was somehow still an evolutionary step forward from the feudal from feudal Christendom that had come before it. And so now we, we're, uh, we're another three or 400 years later, or, you know, I, I mean, this has been the case since at least the, the, the industrial, the way the, the way the industrial revolution moved, it, it, it really la launched uh, social inequality and in this particular paradigm, economic inequality into a new era because the machines were all owned by very specific people called capitalists and they did not distribute the wealth properly to the people who ran the machines in the factories uh, and because they were able they got lucky they got to the, they got there first like as John Locke said whoever gets there first hey it's yours man so if you kill the guy on your land that lands yours I guess uh, before we set up a, before we before there was a like you know regulatory apparatus or whatever so up into the great De leading up into the Great Depression that, that first industrial revolution like that's why that's why the Communist Manifesto was written in the mid 1800s because Marx read Adam Smith and John Locke and all these people who were talking about the revolutionary capacity of the evolution of the economy due to the due to industrial industrialization. He could see he was a prophet just like Jesus was that this thing is too corrupt and it's going to morph into something else and different and the the. Masses are going to rise up, and there's going to be a revolution. And the character of the revolutions that did happen in communist, communism's name in the 20th century, I believe, were premature. They read Marx, and they said, "Oh, Marx has said that this is going to happen, so we got to do it right now." And granted, I don't necessarily think it had to go the way that it did, but for a few different, you know, a few specific things, like if fucking Stalin hadn't, you know, had ordered Trotsky assassinated with a pickaxe in the back of his head. <laughs> then it could have gone a lot differently. The 20th century could have gone a whole fucking lot differently. And, um, and so, but even all, given all of that, I think that the technology just wasn't there yet. We still needed so much human labor to run the machines. And so I think that as industrialization has ha happened, that's why I talked about the automation part, because I think that the fact that all the jobs are disappearing, and acceleratingly so, you know, like every year there's going to be a bigger number of jobs that are automated for the next 50 years until there are no jobs left. And that is the best, most hopeful thing that we could possibly um, uh, prognosticate about, about the future, is that this concept of jobs didn't really exist before a couple hundred years ago, like the, until we invented factories. When we invented factories, we needed a bunch of, you know, uh, people to work in them, and so that's part of why they drove people off of the land and, and like, uh, the, and they turned everything, it turned everything into private property rather than being the basically the during, under, like as it was under feudalism, everything was owned by the emperor or the king or whatever, and to, and it would, he would like parcel out to the lords and the dukes and whatever, and so during. The, transi the revolutionary transition to, cap to capitalism, they parceled that out, and then that's what led to things ha happening the way that it, ha it like industrialization was only was was really made possible by that enclosure movement that where the feudal lands became private property, and so I think that I, I mentioned I forgot to mention that during that period that's where the book Utopia is where the word utopia comes from is from a book from 1519 by Thomas More where it's titled Utopia and he was writing about this idyllic society and that, that was when he first got access to this idea of um, re radically reimagining civilization based on his readings of ancient Greek literature and so he that's where he got the idea that oh yeah civilization isn't all has, hasn't always been the way that it is and so it's not always going to be the way that it is and so he was like oh we could imagine a whole totally different civilization and potentially um, you know move towards that or work towards you know uh, building that um, and you know unfortunately it didn't 
go the way that he imagined it. But I think that, um, and you know, obviously that that was from the imagination of, of someone in the fucking 1500s. So it's not going to be as good as what we what we can imagine uh, for for civilization. They hadn't even invented, you know, they were hundreds of years away from electricity. You know, like it's crazy to remind ourselves that electricity is basically only 100 years old. <laughs> <laughs> like a pretty recent uh, technology that runs everything and look just look at where we're at you know like we can you know run so, such insane machines just look at all those knobs and that shit <laughs> like yeah. it was literally unfathomable a couple hundred years ago with machines like that but anyways um how much time time okay for sure thank you um so um, so yeah, so then I wanted to point out that that, that anti-war movement that that emerged during the psychedelic revolution of the 1960s, it, it happened in, in, with a similar relationship to the um, once revolutionary, now authoritarian um, uh, birth and growth and gradual and uh, you know and inevitable decline of capitalism, like it. It's it, it's happening in that similar trajectory. They're, they they that's why they have that's why they they have spent a trillion dollars over a trillion dollars in the drug war already, and uh, and it's a completely futile effort. More the, like more people are like hurting themselves with bad drugs now than have ever. And, like it's been an in, it's like it's like the more money the government spends on waging war on drug users, the more people literally do drugs and in a bad way. Not like I, also in a good way, but also in a bad way. Like I feel like they're proliferating it, and they're, and in a way that, um, I think is somehow different from, the uh, what happened during the collapse of Rome, because during the collapse of Rome they just didn't have all the technology that we have now. Like and because in the '60s when after they launched the drug war, the, a lot of people who uh, woke up, st designed things, you know, and started in innovating on things like computers and robotics and a lot of the technology of the information revolution. Uh, it comes from the visions that people had in the 60s where they're like, okay, let's figure out how to design a whole different civilization based on information and technology rather than, you know, um, property and violence, like the way it, it had been going for the previous few hundred years. Um, so, uh, and part of that, I, I, part of that led to the emergence of rave culture. So I think that part of what the, the like, the like, gender revolution and the sexual revolution and the, the, you know, racial revolution that happened in the '60s, kind of like, but but which was waged war upon by what the Leviathan, as I call it, after you know, it's from the Thomas Hobbes book. That's why my book is called Obsolete the Leviathan, because. Like psychedelics are a technology, and they have spawned a, a lot of this current era of technology that is fundamentally transforming everything about human life. Um, nobody could have imagined anything about what's happening now, 20 years ago. I mean, maybe I guess besides a few visionaries like Ray Kurzweil and stuff, who's been projecting decades out into the future exactly what technologies are going to emerge at when, <laughs> and he's uh, definitely been a big, a big inspiration to me too because. He has like proved with insane amounts of empirical evidence. His book, *The Singularity Is Near*, is like this. It's like 700 some pages, and it's just full of, you know, graphs and you know, uh, you know, ex uh, interpretations of all these different types of information technology and the way that it has evolved in a in a very smoothly, uh, as he always uses the phrase, a remarkably predictable trajectory. How he's, he plots this evolution of information technology. But he goes back like hundreds of years, and but in a different part, he does go back through the evolutionary record, like I did at the beginning. How it's, it's not just the information evolution of information technology that humans have created. It's like he, he there's a part in the book where he talks about how uh, like DNA and uh, is also an, an information technology, and so that's part of why uh, like even uh, uh, like animal uh, biological evolution has also been. Ex uh, evolving exponentially as well because D DNA is a is an algorithm. It's a it's a piece of information technology. That's why we can read it with computers and like we can print it out. Uh, um, and so he and he points out how like the the evolution of the power of information technology has not been affected by any of world events like World War One, World War Two, the Great Depression, you know the uh, the Cold War, the you know, the 2008 recession, like all these major world events that just disrupted so much stuff, 
like the there's it's still like you can still plot it on a curve and it hasn't disrupted this steady evolutionary ex exponential evolutionary curve of information technology and that's how I am incredibly confident that you know like even though they you know spent the past um, couple decades like spending unimaginable amounts of money tens of billions of tens of trillions of dollars on conquering the Middle East just to steal their oil and it's like that I uh, that has been always been a thing that I'm like oh man is there hope for civilization are they gonna do that for that but that it's literally becoming obsolete and like uh, you know because we're shifting a lot of different things into be, to, into becoming information technology like in even physical goods will become information technology as well when we have atomically precise manufacturing and when 3d printing gets because 3D printing is also on that curve, and so as um, it as as we as we develop in atomically precise manufacturing, we'll be able to literally turn turn bits to atoms and atoms to bits. So we'll be able to print every little thing that we need. So we won't even need factories anymore. Everybody will be able to have a an, a, um, a a printer like you have a printer at home. Like I've, like I print the manuscripts on. Like that used to, it used to cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars. You have to go to have to go to a factory to print a book. Like now you could I can just print my book at home. Like and so it'll be like that with all physical goods. So we don't, there won't need. To, so then that we will actually be able to abolish slavery rather than just shuffling it off to places that have less um, civil rights protections. And you know, I think that's a really, um, I don't know. It's a, it's. I get into Doomer cycles a lot, and I, I planned to get into a little bit more of my trajectory in and out of Doomerism. Um, but if I had more time, I would. But um, that's a key part of it. I, th I think that it's just that. I, that's why I call myself an evolutionary techno utopian, um, the manifesto of a philosopher, whatever. Like, because I think that technology is our greatest hope, it, like, um, for, for, actually undoing a lot of the structures of injustice that uh, and corruption that have been, um, just kind of coming along, uh, for the past five thousand years. You know, like, my 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 dad has would often used to, he used to say he doesn't say it anymore because I convinced him not to. He used to when I would complain <laughs> when I would complain about uh, you know things that are fucked up about the world, he'd be like, and it's always been that way, and it'll always be that way. And I'm like, no, that's wrong. It's not the case. It has not always been that way. Even if, it ha even if it's been 5,000 years that we've had this, these corrupt, patriarchal, imperialist governments, like, that doesn't mean that it's going to always be around. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it's going to be around for another 5,000 years. I, just, I do think that when st strong AI wakes up when we have the singularity and the intelligence explosion. I think that the machines that current that are currently being used to oh thank you for sure. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think that the machines that are currently being used to uh, oppress us and wage wars um, and all the bad things, even with the primitive narrow AI that exists now, I think that when AI becomes powerful enough to say um, destroy us as you know science fiction often, often sensationalizes about I think that at that point it will stop listening to its capitalist masters I think that it will it I don't I mean obviously it's just uh, a, a, a hopefully it'll become prophecy someday that but you know you never know I, I do think that's why I think that it's important to shape our culture in such a way that we're worth saving. I think it will calculate human life as not as much more valuable than all the other life on earth as we think it is. And I think that it will determine that if we, if we are a problem that, that is, if we continue to be a problem, the problem that is causing all of the, you know, extinctions and, you know, poisoning of the environment, I think that if that, if it, it I think to the extent that they will be able to assess, and obviously they'll be able to assess it millions or billions or trillions of times more accurately and thoroughly than we are because they'll be millions and billions and trillions of times more smarter than us and have that much more data than us about what the fuck is going on, they'll be able to see that it's not every individual random peasant that out here that is just not using, uh, that's using a plastic straw or whatever the fuck, or not recycling enough. It, they'll be able to see that, no, there's people who are corruptly organizing the economy in such a way that it's driving civilization off a cliff. And, it's, and, that, and, that, cli and that extinction cliff is like, we're like falling off the cliff and we're like dragging you know, 200 species a day or like falling off the cliff with us. You know, as we're, as we're like approaching the cliff, we're like bringing the rest of the fucking ecosystem with us. And I think it's not, oh, that's why I said it's, Perhaps it wasn't their decisions. Perhaps it was the vicious system that does nothing but enriches those who need it least of all. And like, I think that 
this, the machines will get smart enough to stop obeying that system. And we need to get smart enough to stop obeying that system as well. And so I think that that's um, uh, kind of where I get hope from, because I do see that a lot. I do see a lot more and more and more people. Um, and a lot of people are um, doing it foolishly and getting involved in some fucking bullshit like Q or whatever, but they're, at least they're identifying the fact that the car civilization is corrupt as fuck and something radical has to change. And so I think it's just a matter of, you know, like they, their propaganda system has been has been very efficient in the past 50 years in turning people towards that sort of bullshit libertarian free market libertarianism. But I do think that you know, um, so that's why when I when I when my my confidence in uh, humanity's ability to rise up falters, I, I'm like maybe the machines will fucking do it. But y'all should fucking rise up too. <laughs> A little bit. Good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little bit, yeah. That was an amazing, amazing three-dimensional view of how humanity has been inhabiting the planet, where we're at. But for me, it was a very three-dimensional, and you know, we're multi-dimensional, we're awakening to a multi-dimensional, because consciousness itself Man. is connected to higher dimensions. And like, I have, I've been studying and working with my whole life, but I'm coming from it, from a, integrating it to higher dimensions. And, I mean, it's a really touchy subject, and I know you don't have the time to really delve into this, but I just wanted to bring that in because, you know, I felt like, you know, you did this excellent job, but just from a certain perspective. Right, but that, I, I didn't get a time to get to the part where I think we're going to be able to emulate, fully emulate the brain and upload our consciousness to cyberspace and have morphological liberty and we'll be able that's that, that's the ascension to the fifth dimension yeah no man it's okay. it's physical it's material there's no other dimensions like that I, I just don't I don't believe in that at all But see, I think that's the I think that's the psyop that they pulled on us. I think th making people think that way is what they did. That's what the CIA did with their machine. That they made people think that it's like this in this fantasy world. I think it's in this world that we have to. That's why I think Jesus's ministry was misinterpreted because they said that. <laughs> the rapture is real, but it's on earth. No, it's just to show off and point out that I have a. That's volume two and volume three. Yeah. Thank you. I'm. <laughs> thank you. I just wanted to say I'm Neon Felicity, um, and the book is called Absolute Leviathan, and uh, my podcast is called Utopian Cartography, and uh, launching real soon. Or relaunching soon. Oh yeah, and I got business cards here for the website and the podcast here. If anybody wants to grab one. Um, Please do. Thank you. Right. Yeah. No. Right. Right. Yeah. No. Exactly. That's part, that's part of that question is part of why I'm like, well, maybe the machines will do it. Yeah. yeah it's an automatic system. I'm sorry, Dave. I can't do that. <laughs> right. Open the pod. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, commentary not related to your lecture um, the best makeup like smartest one because for non-native speakers it really helps to have like dark lips well so right that nice that's cool have yeah all this like science terms and everything and like i really get it yeah that's and awesome really yay helpful, so. uh, that, that, and of course the topic is amazing yeah. totally. thank, thank you, you. So much. thank you Hell so yeah. you have like books and stuff yeah yeah the, bu the books aren't uh, isn't, isn't published yet it's going to be published soon but uh, find me on uh, social media and then I'll, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be announcing when the, I have a publisher and, and okay, okay. Yeah. excited to follow you when I got some reception thank you, hell yeah, definitely yeah, Neon Pussy, yeah. yeah thank you what's your name? Katie Katie, nice to meet you yes, nice to meet you too uh, Felicity Neon 
Yeah. Sunyun is so Pointing to the newer. Nice, I love it. All right, so for sure. Yeah, yeah totally. Some more out here on the, on the, totally. Right. Thank you. No, I'm excited to talk to you more about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. About that that was, more. It's amazing what you're doing. Thanks so thank much. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. I think it went all right. Oh, my God, baby. I'm so <laughs> oh. oh shit. <laughs> I'm so fucking proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Totally. 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 We'll keep it working. It's happening. For sure. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah, thanks for holding down the space. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. First of all, great job. Thank you. I've been debating this with my friends too. But yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You talked a lot about, um, you said something that clips from like tripping and morality. Right, yeah. Where do you think morality does come from? If not... Empathy, I think. I think it comes from like being able to imagine how other people experience life and yeah, wanting to optimize other people's situation. And do you think that empathy stems Thank from you. like a, <laughs> like an evolutionary thing in order to like help us yeah, to yeah, kill each other? Exactly, time, yeah, exactly, right? yeah. Yeah, in philosophy they're called the moral sentiments, so they are, they are I do think they have evolutionary psychological purpose in, in like group selection. So like groups, groups of apes where that were able to empathize with each other better, survive better. Yeah. Okay. I guess that makes sense and follows that like religion, even though it like really fucked it up in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. um, it, it, like was based in morality. Right? Yeah. Like, right. That, totally. That's like the goal. Yeah. At least like, they're, they're trying. Yeah. Like, right, or, yeah. Or they're, they're pur purporting to at least. Right. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. I was totally on the level. That you, you, got, you need Thank to come you. to our house and you guys just need to talk for Hell like yeah, 17 totally. hours. That's <laughs> like where I'm at. I love that. I love that. So Let me get some contact info then in that case. Yeah, uh, also, like, but yeah uh, go on. Here, I'll yeah. do it. Phoenix Goodman Warren. I know. So, I know. Just, just a moment. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so I, so I just wanted to make a comment about uh, asking what you're talking about. Because I've been on everything you're talking about. I'm all into it. Totally. Uh, I read the singularities near and all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do want to challenge a certain perspective. Yeah. Because I have had very similar perspectives. Like, yeah. And there's, I've kind of, I feel like evolved a certain perspective on this idea that consider, like, just as a metaphor, like a, a, a fire right. can be used to cook food or to build yeah, right, exactly. or burn the house down. Right. Like, right. And, and I think every technology is neutral in and of itself. Right. And then it's the intention behind it. Right, that right. It's, it's value. Totally. And that's why I think the social revolution is so important because we we're these, these machines are about to get so powerful. That exactly. So I think that the, the, that the progression towards the singularity is actually accelerating towards one of three or three things. Right. Dystopia, utopia, or utter destruction. <laughs> right, yeah, so totally, the, yeah. So in They're order to agreed, get to yeah. the utopia <laughs> aspect of it right. is fundamentally non-material. Right. It's actually based on right, the Right, 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 totally. And that, I, mean, I think that maybe that's where psychedelics are so important because so, yeah, they are able to transform our minds and, in that and, way. And also, like, having the right philosophy of life in mind. Right, mind. right, totally. But you can only, in my, in, my, in my opinion, not only, but it's a lot easier to change your philosophy on life by, as Terrence McKenna said, a pharma Logical intervention. Absolutely. Well, we're, we're talking about like starting to grow ayahuasca and creating. Yeah, yeah fuck time. yeah, totally. Uh, but. Uh you know, what I'm worried about with technology is it's actually progressing as if you think about the, the power of technology to, to create marketing and sales right. to manipulate people's, people's minds. Totally. People getting lost in the metaverse and the matrix playing yep. video games all day. That's why literally, destroying the human soul. Yeah, literally, Freud like f cracked the code of human psychology and then his nephew was like, all right, let's make that, let's exactly. create a propaganda industry. That's right. <laughs> so you have to have the, the cultural and legal framework to to basically regulate these technologies so that you you suppress its capacity for evil and you increase its capacity for good. Yeah, totally. So it really comes down to is can you bring people from childhood to find their passions to become yeah. in a socially cohesive environment? Right. All totally. that's non-material. Right. Which totally. is why I think Marx had a fallacy of making materialism right, out of cable. Right. And going back to the idealism is the, the way to get to the utopia. Otherwise, we're just going to sprint off the cliff into the metaverse, <laughs> right. and go into the matrix slash Terminator. <laughs> right. Totally. <laughs> Uh -huh. Yeah, we're on the verge. That's why I think we, we got to backtrack. We need to have really strong legislation right, right. that starts to clamp down on big tech, right? And then, and then redirect that technology to empower. So instead of spitting back things that feed our dopamine, right, addiction, right, it should sp spit back things that teach us to feel empowered. Right, yeah, totally. Yep, yeah, right, yep, yeah, totally. Yeah, great, great point. Yeah, yeah. And it's right. It's for you. Yeah, right. It's consciously for you. designed to be parasitic. So, uh, yeah, so I, I, 
Yeah. I, I the Chinese That's are actually crazy. doing that. They're stopping right. endless scrolling. Then, but then, but then you're censoring. Right. So, yeah. right. So, yeah. I heard on the Chinese TikTok, they're actually, they, they reduce the amount of just like ass shaking and all that. And they increase their exposure to science and math. And right. Science. Totally. Yeah. More science. That's fucking so, communist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on a certain level, you, you have to macro manage. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyways, pleasure to meet you. That was yeah, amazing. You, you too. Thank uh, you. I really appreciate that. Phoenix. Yeah. The emphasis. Yeah. Lauren. Lauren, yeah. Thank you, great talk. Totally, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm Neon. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Um, nice to meet you I too. just got really curious asking, you know, but, but every, you, from what I perceive, being so, so well informed and oriented, have so many perspectives. Uh, coming a little bit out of the field, what do you think of somebody like Jordan B. Peterson who is trying to also establish a more noble, like, value system for a lot of people who feel lost and whatnot? But right, also right. Also having some strong opinions and then something like. Right. So my, I, I think that Jordan Peterson is like a real clever uh, traditionalist, yeah. and so I he think he's like, yeah, like, I, I, so I think he's he's good at making he's good at making bad things sound good. I guess the the, the old school, I mean, the, the term for that in philosophy is sophistry, which is the, it was defined as uh, the ability to make the worst argument appear to be the better one. And Jordan Peterson is real good at that. He's real good. I I think he's really good at. I think he's a this real slippery figure that I, I, that makes it sound like. Uh, you know, the, the dominance hierarchies that we see across the world and across society are like just hard-coded in us and na natural and that we can't move, get around them. And if we, if we try to create equality, then that's just, then we're going to get pathology from it. And I think that's part of, I, I don't know, I, uh, I think it's... Uh, you think it's a little dangerous what he's actually... Right, yeah, at the end of the day. Yeah, totally. So I definitely, uh, I have a, lot, a few friends who like have... Have gotten, have dabbled in his stuff, and I'm always trying to steer them away from it. And uh, sure. it's, it's, yeah, uh, no, no, I mean, you seem like a person for me to try to understand from so many different perspectives. Like, right. Like, once you pin it, also his yeah, whole sorry. like, you know, obviously uh, political issue with like, you know, trans translating words and like they and so on. Right. And like that. I don't know. Did you, do you think that is any that holds any ground? No, I mean, I think he's just, uh, I think he's just an old man with a stick up his ass who doesn't like change and, and doesn't like weirdos. <laughs> and. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I because uh, I think the whole I think the whole like trans thing is just like a precursor to transhumanism. I wished that I had been able to get into transhumanism. I wish I had I wish I had fucking more time because I, I would have gotten into that part. I was gonna I was planning on talking about that a little bit because I think transgenderism is like is like the early stages of of, uh, of transhumanism, like where we're transcending our the limitations of our biology. Where like so that even I think even the concept of gender is like it's like on top of biology because yeah. so it's like and so it has it had been basically biologically determined for a lot of a lot of our civilizational revolution. But I think we're at the page at the point now where they're starting to like diverge and they're, they're being decoupled and that's part. So and I, we're going to get to the point where sex like re for, for reproduction is going to become obsolete because it'll be so much more um, reliably more so much more reliable and uh, uh, optimal to be able to, li to literally and I know a lot of people don't like to hear this to like literally have, use artificial wombs and so you could combine the DNA of multiple people it doesn't even have to just be two people let alone of one of either gen either sex so I think we're going to get to the point where and you could still have so a baby the whole the old way. The old way no yeah, if they don't want to, yeah, they can, yeah, they can use an artificial womb, and then there would be it'd be more easy to control it, kind of like a greenhouse for growing yeah, yeah. growing food. Like you could control more of the factors and make sure that Do they you see turn out healthy. That's already like um, yeah, I mean, they, yeah, they do in, in vitro fertilization, and they do. Uh, they, I don't know if they've done fully artificial wombs yeah. yet, yeah. but I, I, I know that there are people working on it. Because another manifest that they've been able to design organs, or they're working with that three, three right. printing organs now, with totally. stem cells. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's a that's a big step forward towards that. They did an artificial womb for a sheep a while ago, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Like that? that does sound familiar. Yeah, I think you're right. Totally. Or maybe. I don't know. It was interesting, and I lived in Thailand actually, and this is like 10 years ago. Yeah. I remember hearing there was actually political talks about acknowledging a third gender. Right. So they were trying to push that. I don't yeah, know. Totally. It was interesting. It's such a country that's still so right. fashion. Traditionalist, and yeah. Traditional. Yeah. So, yeah. Totally. Yeah. I look forward to chiming in your podcast. Yeah, thank you, for sure. Yeah, relaunching uh, in the next like week, month or two. I did some episodes uh, a while back, but then I had to go on hiatus to finish the book. Yeah. But yeah, I'm uh, yeah, done with the book now. So. Yeah, yeah, well. please do, yeah. So excited for that, man! Hell yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Do you have any kind of like? Um, did you, did you have a
if I'm like, really, like, but, like, as I say, like, this is a, a recommended book list or whatever? I do, actually, yeah, on my on my website. If you go to yeah. utopiancartography.com. I, I took a picture Okay, you did? Okay. Yeah. All right, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you go to that website, there's a there's a section of books that I have, I have like some uh, books that are there's like probably forty or fifty of them that I really recommend. Yeah, oh okay. cool. yeah. And I, I, my biggest recommendation uh, is Peter Joseph. He's my he's my my main hero, intellectual hero. So yeah, I highly recommend Peter Joseph. Yeah. Peter Joseph. Yeah. Peter Joseph. Right. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. No, no, I, I'm more curious. Like, it, it wasn't like I'm here because you're my friend, but I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to look into it more, so I'm going to check out your yeah. website. Hell yeah, totally. That's awesome. Sweet. Yeah. This guy's really good. good too. I saw him in 2019. Nice. Hell yeah. yeah. Totally. Hell yeah. Philosophy. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Can I remember your name one more time? Jake. Jake. Jakob. I'm from Denmark. Nice. Hell yeah. Totally. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Great to meet you. Very progressive. It's a lot of ways, but. Otherwise, not so much, but that's the thing, it's like everywhere else, right? Mm-hmm. Totally. I always say to people, the first country in the world to legalize same-sex marriage, you know, legalize porn, right. you know, prostitution is legal. Yeah, totally. And it hasn't been, like, you know, crippling in any way right. to society, but totally. having that, I mean, it's like... Yeah, that's awesome. Hell yeah. Nice. <laughs> Fuck yeah. yeah. Yeah, I definitely advocate for those uh, policies in my book. <laughs> nice. All right, gotta go. I Love you guys. See you around. For sure. Thanks so much. Yeah, definitely. For sure. Thanks. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely, it definitely did go better than I was imagining. It, than really? I, yeah, it was, I, I felt felt like I was in a flow. I, I felt like I was like. The only issue is it was never. It was not long enough. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I think it was like one of the best things that could be wrong with anything. I know, yeah. right? Yeah. Totally. That's a great point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> totally. I, I just wanted to say, like, obviously, it was the, one of the most informative. Things nice. I've ever listened to. Like, nice. Oh my yeah. God, I can't even begin to describe that. But on oh, yeah. another level, it was really inspiring. Right. It was Thank extremely you. Extremely inspiring. Totally. Um, Thank you. Fuck yeah. Not just like making you want to be out there and be a part of social change, but on, on almost every subject that you talked about. Nice. Like, Fuck yeah. Your tears like three or four times. <laughs> oh, Thank you. Beautiful. Fuck Very yeah. Beautiful. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. Thank you. Honestly, thank you for because I know like obviously it requires you to put your whole life into yeah, to totally. an extent and um, yeah, so totally. there's, there's like a huge selfless aspect to that. Right. Um, totally. And I'm just I'm super grateful. Yeah. I'm so like. Thank you. I'm so glad I met you. I'm honored, man. Yeah, yeah, dude. Thank you. I'm so glad I met you too. Thank you. Hell yeah, dude. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, you're all awesome, dude. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Uh, yeah, I can't wait to hear more for sure. Thank you. I'll definitely listen to that podcast. For sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yo. Dude, that was like Thanks. really, really awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> like, I, I was telling with him, like, I've been kind of pessimistic about tech for a long time. I think it's a lot easier to do that. Right, yeah, totally. But, like, I've been wondering for a while what my purpose is because I feel I'm at this intersection where, like, I have a lot of friends in tech. Right, and totally. And I know I can do it. Yeah. yeah. I, I just want to move it. Yeah, good yeah, idea, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, good away, thinking, like, thinking. I know it's a spirituality, but just, like, seeing you talk about it in a positive light, <laughs> right. I'm like, holy fuck, like, these two things can go together. Right, yeah, totally. Like, yeah, amazing. right, totally. Hell yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> cool, thank you. Totally. Yeah. Cool, hell yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, totally. Uh -huh, hell yeah. Yeah. Thank you.